So we're going to be talking about how I met the Hare Krishna devotees and how I became a devotee. I grew up in the late 60s, so that was when the movement just began. And when I was 17, I first started seeing devotees on the street chanting, and I thought it was unusual, but very attractive. And I grew up in Los Angeles, and that's where I first met the devotees. Later, I traveled to San Francisco, spent Easter vacation, I saw some devotees there. And then two years later, I attended university in Berkeley, California, and then I saw devotees there, and that's where I became interested. And one day I was walking near the university and I stopped in a bookstore, and I came across the Bhagavad Gita, and I told myself I should read this book. I didn't know what it was. I could understand it was something from India, and I was a little bit intrigued by Indian philosophy. And so later on, I met some devotees, and they were actually teaching the Bhagavad Gita as an accredited course in the university, and that's where I studied Bhagavad Gita. So my first meeting with my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, was actually through his book, Bhagavad Gita. And then that semester, which was 10 weeks, I studied Bhagavad Gita, I read it twice, and after about six weeks of studying it, I felt that I wanted to be a devotee. And when I look back in retrospect and people say, why did you just give up your education why were you interested? Why did you become a monk? Were these things that you, that you were planning on doing when you were young? And the answer is no. But in reflection, I think it's because of something I cultivated in my past life. Because around the age of 17, 18, I kind of felt that I had done everything that I wanted to do in life. That um, now I was ready for something else. And normally people feel that way when they're 60 or 70, not when they're 17. So I feel that in a past life, I was connected with this knowledge, I was connected with this lifestyle, and I had made some progress, and now in this life, I was just continuing. So when I got Bhagavad Gita, everything just fell into place. As I was reading it, I would think, I understand this, I can't articulate it, but it just feels like what I'm understanding, it feels like how I'm seeing life. So as I read Bhagavad Gita, I thought, this all makes sense. This is what I'm looking for. Now, there was an intellectual aspect, and then there was an emotional aspect. Intellectually, I was answering a lot of questions, like, where have I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What am I supposed to do with my life? And that was a big question for us in the late 60s. Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? We don't want to do what our parents did. It doesn't seem to make sense. You're just working, you get money, get a house, get married, have a family, get old and die, take a few vacations, have a little bit of fun, have a little bit of suffering. It just it didn't make sense to us. So Bhagavad Gita kind of put everything into place 
by teaching that I'm not the body, I'm an eternal soul. I've been here before, I will continue to live. And the purpose of life is to realize who I am and eventually attain liberation or divine connection, reconnect with God in an eternal relationship. So when I understood that, after that semester, I decided I want to dedicate my life to this and I want to help other people understand it. So I moved in the ashram, I was 19, I gave up everything, and then I took a vow to follow four principles. No gambling, no illicit sex, no intoxication, and no meat eating. And that was a big change in my lifestyle. But due to the ashram environment, which was very pure, I was able to do that. And then I began chanting every day for a minimum of two hours. And that chanting had transformed my life. Actually, when I was going to college, the devotees were on campus and they were chanting. So practically every day I would join them and my life was transforming by that chanting. And as I was saying, the emotional experience was one of fulfillment. That there were so many things I was doing in my life that weren't fulfilling me. And I was doing them again and again and again and still I wasn't fulfilled. And I knew there must be something more. The chanting was fulfilling that need. Uh, about a year before I moved into the ashram, I was experimenting with psychedelic drugs. And on one trip, I had this, I had this deeply rooted intuition that the happiness I was getting that was drug-induced was something that I could experience without drugs. And it was kind of driving me crazy because I kept telling myself, you can get this without drugs. You don't need drugs to experience this happiness. It was just something like I felt I always knew. And at that point I decided I'm not going to take drugs and I'm going to look for a solution. I'm going to look for a way. And shortly thereafter I came across the chanting of Hare Krishna, began practicing it, and it actually fulfilled that need for that kind of happiness, actually in a much greater way, in a more deeply satisfying way. So. So when I saw the devotees chanting, it was kind of like the answer to my search for finding that happiness that doesn't come from drugs, or you could say it doesn't come from anything outside myself. So I began practicing Krishna consciousness, and every day was exciting, every day I was learning, and I feel that in that year after I dropped out of college, that I actually learned more about life, about myself, about the world, about God, about spirituality, than I learned in my entire life. It was an amazing educational experience, studying Bhagavad Gita every morning, every evening, discussing this philosophy with my fellow devotees, and going more deeply into the understanding of Bhagavad Gita. So it was an amazingly enriching experience. Now, a lot of Indian people they find it amazing that because we weren't raised with these beliefs, we weren't raised with this culture, that we would be attracted to it. But when I was very young, I was attracted to India. I can't say why, it just allured me. And as I was mentioning, I was in this bookstore and I was attracted to the Bhagavad Gita and I didn't even know what the Bhagavad Gita was. It was just a book on a shelf that looked very Indian. And somehow or other, I was just drawn to it. And one of the most interesting things about it is that I never used to read. I was very athletic, very active. I wasn't a studious type person. So I didn't read books. Only books I read were books that I had to read for college. And now I'm in a bookstore. For some reason, I'm in a bookstore. And this book, it attracts me like a magnet. And this voice inside of me says, you should read this book. At that point, I didn't have any money. A few days later, I was on campus, and there was a Hare Krishna devotee offering an accredited course on Bhagavad Gita. So, I had already committed to this voice within to study Bhagavad Gita, and there the Bhagavad Gita was. So, when I recount this scenario, it really seems to me like this was the path that I was on in a past life, and now everything was falling into place. I was ready, I was 19, I had certain experiences that I believe made me ready for spiritual life, experiences that I needed to go through in order to take up the life of a monk, and everything fell into place. And there I was on campus, 
Bhagavad Gita as an accredited course. I just committed myself to study Bhagavad Gita and there it was. I took it and got instructions twice a week to learn it and then gradually began practicing and everything in my life changed. And now some people say, well, you know, you dropped out of university, you missed opportunities, do you regret it? And I say, no, I never regret it. Because what I've found in my life, what I've achieved, what I've understood, what I've realized is so far greater and so much more nourishing and satisfying and edifying then I believe anything that I would have come across or would have done had I not done this. If I look at the lives of my friends, see how their lives turned out, compare their lives to my life, I feel grateful that I've done this. I think uh, I've really been nourished in ways that very few people have been nourished. So that's my story, how I met Srila Prabhupada, first through his Bhagavad Gita, and then when the semester ended, I went to Los Angeles, that's where I was raised, and it just so happened that the day after I got there, Srila Prabhupada, who was going to be my spiritual master, arrived in Los Angeles, and so I got to meet Srila Prabhupada. And when I first met him, it was an amazingly emotional experience. And when I first saw him, I had the sense that now I've met my eternal spiritual master, and this is the person that's going to bring me back to Krishna. This is the person who's going to end my cycle of birth and death in this world. And it was so emotional, I began crying. So it's a very special time in my life. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. See, we're talking about something dramatic that happened in my life. There, there are many dramatic things that happened because when we were spreading Krishna consciousness, we were willing to get arrested. We were willing to try to do anything if we could reach people with Krishna consciousness. I was arrested many times. I was running from police many times. I'd been driven out of towns, hiding from security in malls. We were very young. We didn't, we didn't care about these things. We just wanted to reach people with Krishna consciousness. And so we were living a little bit on the edge. Uh, you know, we were hippies, so we didn't always care about the law. We just cared about what we thought was right, and we would do that. And um, sometimes, you know, we would fib our way to get into private properties where it would be a very good place to distribute books. Oftentimes the police would tell us we would have to leave. If we find you again, we'll arrest you. We would end up in jail. Um, we would um, be fasting in jail for days. Uh, people would turn against us. They didn't like us. You know, we're young boys and girls who never got into any trouble. And now there's all these people turning against us um, because we're simply trying to give Krishna consciousness. And it was something that we would just, we would happily do. And, and the amazing thing is that we would go through these struggles, we would go through these extremely difficult situations, but at the end of the day we would feel very satisfied and very blissful, even though during the whole day we were just dealing with opposition after opposition, criticism, sometimes people would throw eggs at us, spit on us, um, 
threaten us with violence. And um, it, it actually brought out more of our devotion and made us feel um, just closer to Srila Prabhupada and closer to Krishna. And we, we saw these things as opportunities. Many times in my life as a young man, I was sent to different parts of the world without money, without facility, and asked to spread Krishna consciousness. The first day I arrived in South Africa in 1982, I was 32 years old, and the devotees told me that the previous evening a man had come into their ashram with a machete to come and steal and, if necessary, kill. And that was my introduction to, to what, it, what it could be like, potentially, in South Africa. And, um, you know, we would think, okay, this is what we have to go through, this is what we have to go through. And these challenges were helping us become stronger. And in, in a sense, sometimes we would actually look for them. We, we wouldn't like it easy. We wouldn't like to live a comfortable or casual life. Oftentimes we would travel around the country, three or four of us living in a van, sleeping in a van, in the winter, very cold weather, not having any facility to bathe and just filling up a bucket with water and pouring that on us in the cold winter morning. Uh, and people in the neighborhood seeing that, calling the police, police investigating what we're doing. Uh, and this was just kind of like normal life for us. But for us as young people, especially hippies, counterculture, it was kind of exciting. And it was really good that Prabhupada was able to enlist people like ourselves because we were willing to do these things and we thought it was fun in many ways. So um, some of the, I think, most life-changing events for me were being put in charge of temples at a young age taking big responsibility for spreading Krishna consciousness and not having the qualification. And then having to completely depend on Krishna, also experiencing lots of anxiety about things that I couldn't control or, or having to deal with things that I didn't have experience dealing with, not being very capable, and just being totally, Krishna, help me. You know, that's the only way I can get through this. And it made me very strong. And I went through many, many difficult situations. And if I look back today at my life, I can say that I am much better off for having gone through these challenges. I'm much stronger and much more able to deal with difficult situations, having gone through these at a very early age, having to deal with people who are very difficult, having to deal with antagonism, having to deal with legal issues where we were being wrongly discredited and so forth. And having to get the wherewithal and the confidence and the strength and the balance and the grounding to be able to face this day after day after day. And uh, it was, I would say, it was extremely difficult. Some, when I look back at it, I, I really can appreciate that I went through it. I wouldn't want to go through it again. It was that difficult. But I can say that I'm so much better for it. And uh, as I said before, I always felt very close to Srila Prabhupada going through those difficult situations. So Prabhupada put us in charge, gave us big responsibilities at a very early age, and we were asked to do things for which we had no experience, and we had to learn on the job. And it was off, often extremely difficult, extremely challenging. We made a lot of mistakes, and uh, that's how we learned. People often ask, what was it like to be with Srila Prabhupada? And in one sense, it's a very difficult question to answer because there isn't anyone else like Srila Prabhupada. I've met many people in my life 
But I've never met anyone like Srila Prabhupada. And I think the best way to answer the question of what it's like to be with Srila Prabhupada, what it was like to be with Prabhupada, is to at least first talk about what we felt when we were with Prabhupada. Because the more elevated a person is, the more elevated we feel in their presence. So I think this best describes or I can best communicate what it was like to be with Srila Prabhupada by first explaining that when I was with Prabhupada, I felt a very strong desire to surrender my life to Krishna. And a, a lot of people ask, you know, you were from the West and you had a very materialistic life and a very nice life and why would you give that up for an austere life living in an ashram as a brahmachari. And the reason is, Srila Prabhupada, in his presence, we felt a very strong desire to give our lives to Krishna, drop out of school, give up everything, and just surrender to the Sankirtan mission of Mahaprabhu. That's the effect of being in Prabhupada's presence. Also, when we were in his presence, we felt very happy, we felt very blissful, we felt very energized, we felt very ecstatic. And of course, we all feel this way in our Krishna consciousness, to one degree or another. But in Prabhupada's presence, it was maximized to, I would say, a degree that was far beyond what we could produce by our own bhakti. And a lot of devotees experienced when Prabhupada left, there was like a diminution in their spiritual life, like something had left them. And really, it was that association of Prabhupada, his prayers for us, his words that were, you could say, time-sensitive in context of what was going on in ISKCON, the reports we were getting, learning of the new things that Prabhupada was doing, the challenges we were facing and how he was facing those challenges, how he was guiding us day by day. That was energizing us in a way that I would say would have been impossible for us to be energized or enthused or inspired on our own. So being in Prabhupada's presence was really an experience of, of being given Krishna consciousness to a degree or to a level that we hadn't earned, to a degree that we really didn't deserve, and to, you could say to experience very high levels of Krishna consciousness far beyond really the stage we were at. Another thing in Prabhupada's presence that he brought out on us was a missionary spirit, a revolutionary spirit. Of course, as hippies, as young people, we did have a revolutionary spirit and we did have kind of a counter-cultural, counter-culture spirit. But Prabhupada really maximized that. He said, it's kind of like, here's the world, Krishna consciousness, can change the world, Krishna consciousness can solve the problems in the world, and that's what our mission is. We are going to create a revolution, not politically, but in consciousness. We're going to change the way people think. We're going to change the way people live. We're going to change what they understand to be right and wrong, to be true or false. We're going to change a culture and, and spiritualize it with Krishna conscious principles, with sattvic principles, with, with purity. We're going to help people evolve in their spirituality. We're going to help people connect with their divine qualities. If we do that, we can really make a huge change in the world because change takes place from within. So we were very, very much in this mood of missionaries who had a mission to you know, quote-unquote, save the world, and we were willing to give our lives for that. And one of the main reasons was that that's what Prabhupada was doing. And so we, we were just trying to keep up with Prabhupada. We were just trying to do... We couldn't keep up with him, but we were trying to follow in his footsteps, and he was all over the world, preaching up a storm, making newer and newer plans, writing more and more books, going and opening more and more temples, New and new, newer and newer places. And everybody was just caught up in this, this energy. And one of the most interesting things about Prabhupada's presence is it infected the hearts of so many devotees 
that even when you weren't in Prabhupada's presence, being in the presence of his disciples was like being in his presence. You'd go to any temple, you'd meet new devotees, you'd find devotees who were so inspired, things were always expanding, and by that association, we all became inspired. I would say during Prabhupada's presence, it was very difficult to find devotees that weren't inspired. It was very difficult to find devotees that weren't progressively expanding their service and progressively expanding their preaching. It's just, it was going on everywhere. Everything was increasing. And so, whatever your service was, there was always somebody doing a service, even if it wasn't yours, that was expanding their service dynamically to, in such a way, to such a degree, that you'd become inspired in your particular area. This devotee's doing so much in his area, I should be doing so much in my area. So that was very, very common. I remember going to Los Angeles Temple. It was the headquarters in America. Actually, it was the Western World Headquarters. There were about 350 devotees living there in the mid-70s. And just spending one day in that temple had an amazingly inspiring effect on us. So after one day, we were ready to go back to our temple, completely enthused, completely excited about getting back into our service and expanding it. That's what it was like. It was so <laughs> inspiring to be in these larger temples. It was so inspiring to be with the devotees because everyone was doing so much to spread Krishna consciousness. It was, as we say, it was really a movement. Things were really moving. moving. So if you say what it was like to be with Prabhupada, I think we also have to look at what it was like to be with the people that Prabhupada was inspiring because that's the sign of his greatness that he can inspire people to do so much even though they were so young in Krishna consciousness. What else was it like to be with Prabhupada? It was fun. It was exciting because you never knew what he was going to say. It was, it was to me, it was like watching a movie. It was just, Prabhupada was so interesting in that he was unlike anyone else I'd ever met. And so, you never knew what he was going to do next. You never knew how he, he was going to answer a question, even if the question had been asked before. You never knew if he was going to answer it the same way, and often he answered it in different ways, sometimes opposite ways. So being with Prabhupada was, it was just, I don't know how, would, how you could describe it, but it was just, it was always exciting. It wasn't ordinary. It wasn't like you were even in the material world. It was, it was, like, it was like he had brought the spiritual world to us and we kind of entered his bubble of the spiritual world and therefore everything that was happening with that, within that bubble, it was always amazing. It was always, it was always ecstatic. It was always exciting. It was always new. I don't know how better to describe what it was like to be with Prabhupada. As I said, it's, it's difficult to describe without having that experience. But in my life now, all I, all I feel is in extreme gratitude for what Prabhupada gave and everything I do now is just out of service to him to try to pay him back, the sacrifices I make, everything. It's just, uh, it's just Prabhupada gave us such a great gift and he wanted that gift distributed that I feel so obliged to distribute it at whatever cost to my personal life or personal sacrifice I have to make. It's just Prabhupada implanted that within me that this is something that's so valuable and he wanted so much for us to share it that we should sacrifice ourselves, our, our lives and give up our selfishness and personal desires and just give Krishna consciousness to others. And you see that, that seed has been implanted deeply in the hearts of Prabhupada's disciples and you see how much sacrifice they make in traveling and spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world. So that's, if you really want to understand Prabhupada, look at what his disciples are doing. Look at the sacrifice they're making and you can understand that Shakti of Prabhupada is in their heart. That greatness of Prabhupada is making them great. That um, energy that they have, that's Prabhupada's energy. And that purity they have, that's Prabhupada's purity. So the Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Hare
Yeah, you just got back to Russia from Mayapur, so how, uh, yeah, you're missing Mayapur, yes. So Mayapur is very special, and you are very fortunate to be here. So now what you have to do is take Mayapur into Russia. The situation in South Africa where you are is difficult for you because you're being misunderstood by people. They misunderstand your intentions and they misunderstand your motivations. And uh, you feel that you're sincere in what you're doing and they're, uh, they're not appreciating it or you, they think that you're um, something you're not. So you want to know how to deal with that. Well, what do you think? So how's the weather in Mexico? Right now, yeah, it's the winter, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And how are the devotees in Mexico? Things are um, getting better, expanding, growing. And, uh, yes. So you're asking about marriage, right? You want to talk about marriage? And if marriage is uh, how to see it, and if it's if it's just a personal desire, I see marriage a little bit like eating. It's not eating is not really selfish. If you don't eat, you'll die. Or then how to how to to know how to know where to, how to find be. the balance. In yeah. yeah. Well, I think. Uh, Renou renounce life is for very people who are naturally renounced. They don't have to think about it. It's just renounce life is for someone who getting married would be really difficult. It would be really unpleasant because they're very private people or they're very renounced, meaning they're not so concerned about material things. So for that kind of person, they really don't have the question. And, and maybe the question of balance it's not a really issue for, with them because they're not trying to balance a material life because they're all on the other side.